Hey guys, there's a brother in Christ who has a website called ithasbeenwritten.com. Ithasbeenwritten.com is a fountain of information for the believer and unbeliever alike. Link is in the description box and in my pinned comment below. Welcome to the Watchman channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963. Thank you all so much for your prayers and support. God bless. As a sign of his coming and the end of the age, Jesus said this in Matthew 24 10. At that time, many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. This falling away is not only true in that people would no longer believe in God, but the church itself would stop believing in God's word. God tells us what happens if we forget his law in Hosea 4 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also will reject you from being priests for me. Because you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, time is running out. If you do know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it's time to make sure you are right with him, as he is coming soon to take the church home in an event known to Christians and non-Christians alike. The event I am referring to is the rapture of the church, in which millions of true believers in Jesus Christ will be removed from planet Earth. Are you ready for what comes next? A new survey shows few Americans believe the Bible is the literal word of God. According to a recent Gallup poll, 20% of U.S. adults believe the Bible is the actual word of God. That's down from 24% five years ago. 49% of adults believe the Bible is the inspired word of God. Those numbers are a bit better among professing Christians. 25% said they believe the Bible is literally true, while 58% say it is the inspired word of God. Is the Bible allegorical? Or should we interpret the Bible as literal? Allegorical interpretation of the Bible is an interpretive method that assumes that the Bible has various levels of meaning and tends to focus on the spiritual sense. In other words, the Bible is a book full of stories that just teach moral lessons. So, should we interpret Bible prophecy as allegorical or literal? We must take the Bible literally. The more we apply a literal interpretation of the Bible, the better we will understand it. This is the only way to determine what God really is trying to communicate to us. When we read the Bible, we must determine what the author intended to communicate. Many people today will read a verse or passage of scripture and then give their own definitions to the words, phrases, or paragraphs, ignoring the context and author's intent. But this is not what God intended, which is why God tells us to correctly divide the word of truth as we read in 2 Timothy 2.15. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. One reason we should take the Bible literally is because the Lord Jesus Christ took it literally. Whenever the Lord Jesus quoted from the Old Testament, it was always clear that he believed in its literal interpretation. As an example, when Jesus was tempted by Satan in Luke 4, 1 through 13, he answered by quoting the Old Testament passages of Deuteronomy 8, 3, 6, 13, and 6, 16. Luke 4, 1 through 13. Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. And in those days, he ate nothing. And afterward, when they had ended, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command the stone to become bread. But Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, All this authority I will give you, and their glory, for this has been delivered to me and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. 
And Jesus answered and said to him, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Then he brought him to Jerusalem, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, to keep you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered and said to him, It has been said, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Now when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. If God's commands in Deuteronomy 8.3, 6.13, and 6.16 were not literal, Jesus would not have used them, and they would have been powerless to stop Satan's mouth, which they certainly did. The disciples also took the commands of Christ literally. Jesus commanded the disciples to go and make more disciples, as we read in Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. In Acts 2, we find that the disciples took Jesus' command literally, as we read in Acts 16.31. So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. Just as the disciples took Jesus' words literally, so must we. How else can we be sure of our salvation if we do not believe Jesus when he says he came to seek and save the lost? pay the penalty for our sin, and provide eternal life. However, there are figures of speech in the Bible which are not to be taken literally, but those are obvious, such as when Jesus advises us to pluck out a sinful eye or cut off a sinful hand, as we read in Matthew 5, 29, and 30. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish, that for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your own members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. When Jesus tells us to pluck out a sinful eye or cut off a sinful hand, he is employing a figure of speech known as hyperbole. Hyperbole is an obvious exaggeration or an intentional overstatement. Examples of hyperbole in modern speech would include statements like, This bag of groceries weighs a ton. I've been waiting forever. And everyone knows that. The Apostle Paul uses hyperbolic language as we read in Galatians 4.15. What then was the blessing you enjoyed? For I bear you witness that, if possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. Hyperbole, like other figures of speech, is not meant to be taken literally. When we make ourselves the final arbiters of which parts of the Bible are to be interpreted literally, we elevate ourselves above God. Who is to say, then, that one person's interpretation of a biblical event or truth is any more or less valid than another's? The confusion and distortions that would inevitably result from such a system would essentially render the scriptures null and void. The Bible is God's word to us, and he meant it to be believed, literally and completely. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. We're going to begin with the state of emergency in Virginia and the search for people following devastating flooding. More than 100 homes were damaged. The rushing water ripped some houses off their foundations. Trevor Alt is on the scene in Virginia. Good morning, Trevor. 
George, good morning. This is really a catastrophic amount of debris. I mean, all that water rushing down the creek, down the mountain. You see a bridge that's been ripped apart and look at the remnants. Smash car after smash car. We saw power lines that were torn apart too. In fact, look up on the side of this house. This car was smashed up against it too. And this morning now, there are people that officials still have not heard from. Overnight, a desperate search for people still unaccounted for after flash floods ripped through western Virginia. Houses in the road, and it's just a mess. The governor declaring a state of emergency in Buchanan County after six inches of rain fell in just 90 minutes. This pickup hanging on a riverbank, its windshield shattered. Drone video capturing the extent of the damage from the fast moving floodwaters. People lost everything. At least 100 homes suffering severe damage, many lines of communication knocked offline. We were stranded in the house. The water kept coming up. First responders say accessing homes in the remote area has been a struggle for search and rescue teams. And in Maryland, winds taking down trees, knocking them onto cars and power lines. I don't know if it was lightning striking or wind, or but it just was down. And the electrical lines were down, and there's a fire on the fence. Homes knocked right off their foundations. I was sleeping there earlier today. I could have died. Charlotte, North Carolina, heavy rain triggering flash floods in several counties. Well, in Ohio, violent storms ripping through the Toledo area. And officials stress that those people who are unaccounted for are not considered missing. This is a difficult area for communication, especially with all of these power lines being knocked down. They stress so far there are no reported fatalities, but of course they are looking for all of these people. We are living in a time Jesus refers to as the birth pains. God in his grace and mercy is warning the world of his impending judgment. The Bible refers to this judgment as the tribulation in which God will pour out his wrath on an unbelieving an unrepentant world. I have had many people ask the question, how do you know Jesus is returning? And why is today any different than any other time in history? Jesus gives his followers the answer to that question in Luke 21, 28. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. Jesus told his followers that there would be a convergence of Bible prophecy right before his return. Notice Jesus said, when these things begin to happen. Jesus used the plural word things, meaning when you see multiple prophecies converging at the same time, that his return was at the doors, as we read in Matthew 24, 33. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near, at the doors. There can be no denying all these things are beginning to take place. The next question is, how soon is the rapture of the church? From the northwest to the south, Spaniards are sweltering. In the Andalusia region, the mercury soared to 45.6 degrees Celsius on Wednesday. The government is warning people to be cautious and avoid going outdoors unless absolutely necessary. With so much heat, people don't leave their homes so early, so there are no customers until later in the day. This is the second heat wave in Western Europe in a matter of weeks. Forest fires are burning near the border with Portugal and northwest of Madrid, where hundreds of residents have had to leave their homes. France and Portugal are also battling wildfires, and at least one person has died. There is a drought in Spain. Water reserves have shrunk more than 20 percent this year. We say to ourselves, but how are we going to end up? Either we see a lack of water or a desert. It's not so much for us, but for our children and grandchildren. The conditions have made it impossible for barley and wheat farmers to take full advantage of the rising cost of cereals. It would be a loss of 30 to 40 percent, and in some areas of the province of Leida, we're talking about 60, 70, 80 percent loss. Meteorologists say climate change is making both drought and heat waves more frequent. The world is baffled at the events taking place in the weather, and yet it was foretold 2,000 years ago in Bible prophecy that this would happen, as we read in Matthew 24, 3 through 8. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, 
for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Pestilence is the Greek word loimus, which means a plague. Definition of a plague is any large-scale calamity, especially when thought to be sent by God. We are currently living in a time Jesus refers to as the birth pains. The term birth pains is an illustration based on how a woman goes through labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. So we can expect pestilence in the form of extreme weather to continue to be more frequent and more intense right up to the time of Jesus' second coming. As these things get worse, and they will, we know that the Lord's return is not far away. Satan knows he has but a short time and he is using climate change to deceive the masses into thinking it is real, when in actuality it is God letting us know through powerful weather events that Jesus is returning very soon. Climate change is simply Satan's counter to Jesus' signs of his return and the end of the age. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4 but even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. As anyone can plainly see, we are living in the last moments before the return of Jesus Christ. America is in a spiritual battle between good and evil, as we read in Ephesians 6.12, where we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. In recent weeks, pro-abortion rights groups have firebombed and vandalized crisis pregnancy centers around the country that offer free health care for pregnant women and support mothers and babies. We have been forced to expend valuable resources, resources for women of up to $150,000 just to protect ourselves. Abortion activists argue they've been targeted by protesters, too, who blockade access to their clinics. I absolutely condemn violence against everyone, including abortion providers. And claimed overturning Roe will lead to an increase in America's maternal mortality rate. People will suffer unnecessary harm as doctors wait for permission from hospital lawyers. Pro-life witnesses claimed patients given the abortion pill are not prepared for what comes next. At one point, she said she looked down, and what they told her was a clump of cells, was a fully formed baby laying on the floor. This is not health care. In a heated exchange, I want to recognize that your line of questioning um, is transphobic. Republican Senator Josh Hawley questioned a Berkeley professor's use of the term people with the capacity for pregnancy in place of women. Uh, before, uh, I, I want to visit with you, Ms. Maskey, but before I do, I just want to clear one thing up. Professor Bridges, you said several times, you've used a phrase, I want to make sure I understand what you mean by it. You've referred to people with a capacity for pregnancy. It, would that be women? Many women, cis women, have the capacity for pregnancy. Many cis women do not have the capacity for pregnancy. Um, there are also trans men who are capable of pregnancy, as well as non-binary people who are capable of pregnancy. So this isn't really a women's rights issue. It's a, it's, we can it's recognize a that this impacts women while also recognizing that it impacts other groups. Those things are not mutually exclusive, Senator Hawley. Oh, so your view is, is that the core of this, this right then is about what? So um, I want to recognize that your line of questioning um, is transphobic, <laughs> um, and it opens up trans people to violence by not recognizing that. Wow, you're saying that I'm opening up people to violence by asking whether or not women are the folks who can have pregnancies? So I'm one, I want to note that one out of five transgender uh, persons have attempted suicide. So I think it's important Because of my line of questioning? Because so we can't talk about it? Because denying that trans people exist and pretending not to know that they exist I'm is denying dangerous. that trans people exist by asking Are you? you if you're talking Are you? about women Are you? having pregnancies. Do you believe that the, uh, men can get pregnant? No, I don't think so. <laughs> so you are denying that trans people exist? Thank and that leads to violence? Is this how you run your classroom? Are students allowed to question you? Absolutely. Or are they also treated like this? Where no, you, no, no, they're, they're told that to they're at opening up people to oh, violence. We have a good time in my class. You should join. Well, I bet. You might learn a lot. Well, I, I would learn a lot. I've learned a you, lot just I know. in this exchange. Absolutely. Extraordinary. Abortion proponents testified not only do they want abortion access codified into law, 
but they also want Congress to do away with the Hyde Amendment, which prevents taxpayer dollars from funding abortion. Concern of another type of violence tonight directed at churches. Several were targeted in the Washington, D.C. area over the weekend. Two of the churches were set on fire and another severely vandalized. As the investigations start taking shape, parishioners and church leaders worry the attacks will only get worse. CBN's Brody Carter joins us now. Brody, why are they saying that they think things will get worse? Well, John, while these attacks tax and others follow the Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe v. Wade. Authorities think all three crimes are connected, but they're unwilling to draw any conclusions. Faith leaders, though, say they're very disturbed and they worry expressions of hate could linger alongside the national abortion debate. What do we want? Abortion rights! Over the weekend, peaceful protesters rallied in cities nationwide for abortion rights, including the nation's capital. Now there are questions whether some may have chosen violence to voice their opposition. There was some small attempt to burn some of the pews, some books were shredded, and the Stations of the Cross were removed from the wall. Police are looking for suspects who set fires to two churches while vandalizing a third, all located along the same road in Bethesda, Maryland. Investigators say the work of arsonist at North Bethesda United Methodist Church and St. Jane Francis de Chantel Parish forced Sunday worshipers to attend mass at an alternate location. Reverend Samuel Geis with St. Jane Francis drew a direct correlation to what caused the situation. I believe that this is because of the church's stand on the issue of life when it begins and that it should be protected and that this is one of the manifestations of the deep divisions right now within our country. Just down the road, headstones and broken wood were found scattered outside the historic cemetery at Willwood Baptist Church. While the White House condemns violence and threatening protests, they're encouraging pro-abortion advocates nationwide to get loud. Yes, keep protesting because keep making your point. It's critically important. And now there's also a social media group called Shutdown DC willing to pay a bounty to followers for a confirmed sighting of conservative Supreme Court justices John, the nation's tug of war on abortion continues. Here with us now is Heidi Matsky, executive director of the Alternatives Pregnancy Center and a witness at today's hearing. Heidi, thanks for joining us. Since Roe was overturned, what kind of violent attacks are you seeing against crisis pregnancy centers? Well, throughout the nation right now, we have seen everything from fire bombings to broken windows to paint thrown on windows. Um, graffiti, um, and even here recently at our clinic, a man showed up at 8.15 in the morning with a machete, and thank the Lord that our security caught him before any damage could be done. Heidi, speaking of security, can you talk about what steps you have taken to protect yourself, your employees, and the organization? Yeah, since the threats uh, rose over the last several weeks, we decided to take some extensive preventative measures seeing all of the violence that's happened throughout the country. And so we have had to bulletproof our waiting room, bulletproof um, the outside of our building. We've had to paint the outside of our building with anti-graffiti coating. We've had to redo our landscaping, 24-hour on-site security. We've had to upgrade cameras in different locations to protect the safety of our patients. We've had to discontinue the use of our mobile clinic. Brothers and sisters, persecution is coming. Believers in Jesus Christ believe in the authority of the Bible. We believe homosexuality is a sin and marriage is between one man and one woman. We believe in the sanctity of life and that abortion is murder and is a sin. We believe God created us male and female and it is a sin to identify as a transgender. We believe Jesus is the only way to heaven and that believing in any other way will send a person to hell. Get yourself spiritually prepared because true Christians will be persecuted in the United States like no other time in history. This persecution will be based off of what the world perceives to be moral and right and not what the Bible says. The sad thing is that many people who profess to be Christ followers will go the way of the world. These professing Christians are called lukewarm in the book of Revelation and are not saved. The world will persecute true Christians, and Scripture tells us the lukewarm Christians will persecute them as well, as we read in Matthew 24, 9 and 10. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended 
will betray one another and will hate one another. Many who professed faith in Jesus as the Messiah in easier times will deny him and cooperate in exposing those who are true believers. The external hatred from the world puts all true believers in Christ under pressure. This in turn produces internal hatred among the professing Christian community during the tribulation. When the pressure comes, those who are not genuine believers will do three things, fall away, deliver up one another, and hate one another. Matthew 24, 9 and 10 lay out a future time of great persecution for true believers in Jesus. Many in the church will avoid this persecution by betraying fellow disciples in Christ to the persecutors. Persecution is coming. Brothers and sisters, put on the whole armor of God. Ephesians 6, 10-18 Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates His own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. When a person comes to know Jesus as their Savior, they are brought into a relationship with God that guarantees their salvation as eternally secure. To be clear, Salvation is more than saying a prayer or making a decision for Christ. Salvation is a sovereign act of God, whereby an unregenerate sinner is washed, renewed, and born again by the Holy Spirit, as we read in John 3.3 3 and Titus 3.5. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. When salvation occurs, God gives the forgiven sinner a new heart and puts a new spirit within him as we read in Ezekiel 36, 26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. The spirit will cause the saved person to walk in obedience to God's word as we read in Ezekiel 36, 27 and James 2, 26. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So what about repentance? Repentance is not a work we do to earn salvation. No one can repent and come to God unless God draws that person to himself as we read in John 6:44, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Repentance is something God gives. It is only possible because of his grace. All of salvation, including repentance and faith, is a result of God drawing us, opening our eyes, and changing our hearts. God's long-suffering leads us to repentance, and so does his kindness, as we read in 2 Peter 3:9 and Romans 2:4. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, 
but that all should come to repentance? Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Ephesians 2 8 and 9 declares, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Works are not the cause of salvation, works are the evidence of salvation. Faith in Christ always results in good works. The person who claims to be a Christian, but lives in willful disobedience to Christ, has a false or dead faith and is not saved. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. That is why John the Baptist called people to produce fruit in keeping with repentance, as we read in Matthew 3.8. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. A person who has truly repented of his sin and exercised faith in Christ will give evidence of a changed life as we read in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. A person who has not repented of their sin and exercised faith in Christ will give evidence of the works of the flesh, as we read in Galatians 5:19 through 21. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. A person who has crucified the flesh and belongs to Christ will give evidence of the Spirit, as we read in Galatians 5.22-24. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Believers are born again, regenerated when they believe. For a Christian to lose his salvation, he would have to be unregenerated. The Bible gives no evidence that the new birth can be taken away. The Holy Spirit indwells all believers, as we read in John 14, 17. The Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees Him or knows Him, but you know Him, for He dwells with you and will be in you. The Holy Spirit baptizes all believers into the body of Christ, as we read in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For a believer to become unsaved, he would have to be unindwelt and detached from the body of Christ. John 3.15 states that whoever believes in Jesus Christ will have eternal life. If you believe in Christ today and have eternal life, but lose it tomorrow, then it was never eternal at all. Hence, if you lose your salvation, the promises of eternal life in the Bible would be in error. Scripture says, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Remember, the same God who saved you is the same God who will keep you. Once we are saved, we are always saved. Praise God, our salvation is most definitely, eternally, secure. Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today. One day Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God! What if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready!